During this episode, we sit down with Marty Ray, Executive Director of Workforce Optimization at Providence, a national leading health system spanning the West Coast. With hands-on experience across clinical, technology, and leadership roles, Marty brings creative problem solving to address workforce challenges. While together, Marty gives us a behind the scenes look at Providence's strategic approach to empowering caregivers and adopting new technologies. Marty also unpacks the multifaceted nature of workforce optimization from using AI to augment human workflows to listening intently to caregiver needs. Join us as Marty shares feedback directly from Providence's vast network of frontline clinicians and staff on emerging technologies and hear his passion for collaborating across the healthcare industry to reimagine our caregiver workforce during this national staffing crisis. Let's go. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Hi, Marty. A big welcome to our podcast today. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the invitation. Glad to be here. Well, given your expertise as a healthcare leader with practical experience in clinical technology and executive environments, as well as your passion for partnering with executive leaders to shape, develop, oversee, and implement workforce strategy, a very important topic in today's healthcare landscape. I'm really looking forward to this enlightening conversation. But before we dive in, a bit of housekeeping. While listening to any of our episodes, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast so you will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passion of Pioneers with Mike Baselli and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And lastly, please visit the bottom of the episode notes to connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter in order to further the conversations occurring on this podcast. All right, Marty, it's almost time for our community to learn how you and the Providence team are making your health system the caregiver's employer of choice during this national staffing crisis in the healthcare industry. But first, what's that one piece of advice that you would give to others who are passionate about reimagining the health of our world? That's a good question and a big one. I think the one piece of advice that I would give is to lean into listening. That's where it begins. And that's definitely something I'm sure that will come up in the rest of our conversation today. But listening is what's going to help understand where do you build partnerships? Where do you have shared understanding of issues or even solutions that apply to issues that you maybe don't have a common ground on yet. You need to be able to understand where other folks are coming from before you represent where you are coming from. And I think that's probably the first thing that I would bring forward to people. Marty, I absolutely love it. And this is something that I'm fortunate when I get to mentor and advise a lot of startups coming into healthcare, obviously, because it's such a big opportunity, as you know. One of the things I also love to mention is, yes, listen, listen, listen. But that can also then include asking questions, asking questions. It's amazing what you can uncover when you ask those questions, and then, of course, take the time to listen. Is that something that you and your team at Providence and have you personally, is that something that you've had part of your toolkit and kind of your makeup as an executive throughout these years of moving healthcare forward? Oh, absolutely. And in my career journey, I think listening has probably been one of the most important things that I've been able to pick up on it. Once I started to do it intentionally, there's a paradigm shift. You start to recognize that there are things that you were missing before. The opportunity that you give to other people to tell you what's on their mind, to talk to you about their pain points, to express to you what's working, what's not working, is the best opportunity you can put out there. I've personally had that in my own journey. I've been running from a clinical to non-clinical side of the world, and that's the one consistent that runs through both. Well, there's no doubt about it. It does take discipline to sit there and listen and ingest and digest what is being talked about and discussed with those stakeholders where you're trying to move healthcare forward. I love it, Marty. I think it's something that, as you mentioned earlier, got to be disciplined around it. It is a great trait to have, especially during these times of massive change in healthcare and the crises that we're all working hard to solve together. And speaking of, we're going to unpack a lot of that and all the good things happening at Providence as you guys march forward together as one of the leading health systems in the nation to help solve for some of these crises. I'm going to sit back on the other side of this commercial break and listen myself. I cannot wait for our conversation on the other side. We're going to unpack that all and more after we get back from thanking our Community Champion sponsor.
located in Denver, Colorado's nationally ranked River North District. Catalyst is a healthcare innovation campus that brings together stakeholders from across the industry to accelerate innovation and drive real, lasting change our nation desperately needs. From established organizations to startups, from accelerators to advocacy organizations, and from medical schools to global companies, everyone at Catalyst works side by side to create, develop, refine, and bring to market cutting edge innovations that will fundamentally transform healthcare as we know it. With industry leaders like Medical Group Management Association, Olive, Medical Solutions, UC Health, Cirrus MD, and many others calling Catalyst home, along with innovative pioneers visiting from across the nation, Catalyst continually fosters their foundational belief that collaboration and partnerships will move the healthcare industry forward. To virtually tour Catalyst and claim your space on campus or host an upcoming event, visit catalysthealthtech.com or visit the top of the episode notes and click on their link. All right, we are back with Marty Ray, Executive Director of Workforce Optimization at Providence. Marty, you set the stage perfectly. It is an amazing trait to have, especially in this complex industry that we're all working incredibly hard to move forward called healthcare is to be disciplined and listen to the problems, listen to the needs of those end users or those partners or those collaborators that you're working with in this industry. So love how you set the stage, Marty. We're going to be talking about an incredibly important topic today, workforce, how to optimize, how to move us forward, not just to Providence, but what you're seeing as a leader at Providence and on the national level. How do we pull ourselves out of this crisis that we're experiencing across the nation and by the way, you know as well as I do, Marty, this isn't just healthcare. We're seeing this in many different industries, but of course, it's a very acute problem here in healthcare. We're going to discuss that, of course. We also want to you know, dive into a bit. Your journey of becoming an executive director at one of the top health systems in the nation, one of the gold standards, and how you became one of the executive directors for this space with Providence. And of course, we're going to look a little future state. What do you see in that crystal ball? What should we be mindful of? What's coming down the pipe as things are continuing to move? faster and faster in healthcare, then of course, we'd love to discuss how our community can be helping you. But before we get to all of that and more, Marty, let's go back a bit. Let's discuss how did you become part of the Providence family? What led you into becoming a national leader within workforce optimization? Sure. Thanks, Mike. I think like a lot of other folks, my path to where I'm at right now was not a straight one. Moved around a bit trying to figure out for myself in my early career where it is that I not only wanted to be at, but where were my passions. And I think I had a great opportunity to start out in the consulting world and in particular working with strategy execution consulting. So I worked with the folks that managed balance scorecards for a long time. And I think that was a great place for me to cut my teeth because it gave me a big picture view of how organizations view what it is they say they want to get done. And so it gave me a good understanding of how to represent a strategy when it came to the operational tactics. And that was a big part of my understanding that I apply every day in my current role. But like everybody else, I've been part of healthcare my entire life. And like everybody else, I've got a life outside of work. And one of the things that I ended up doing, I think in my late 20s, early 30s, was going back to school and becoming a mental health therapist. So I was a private practice as well as in hospital and in clinic mental health therapist for many years. And so that was kind of my entryway into healthcare as a formal industry, but on the clinical side, probably for those of you that have been listening from the beginning, not that hard to understand now why listening was probably the number one reason that I put forward for people to lean into. It all makes sense now, Marty. (laughs) So it's funny, the world of consulting, the world of mental health therapy, it's all around a lot of the same principles. Listening to other people, recognizing where are their pain points, trying to determine whether or not they have the opportunity or the agency to work themselves through whatever position that they're in. And to me, that was extremely powerful to be able to understand that there's a common thread that ran through the business world as well as the interpersonal world. And eventually I did make a leap and there's probably not enough time for me to explain that leap, but I made the leap back to the business world. And one of the things that I saw when I was in therapy and inside of mental health hospitals and inside of the healthcare industry, so to speak, was that there's a lot of information floating around in the form of just raw data. And from my perspective as a therapist at the time, what I was recognizing is that your raw data is about as useless as you can possibly create. It's as much use as the paperweight on my desk right now if you don't have an appropriate question to pose to it. And so my training in therapy and my training in strategy execution consulting really gave me a good perspective to recognize that the healthcare industry is sitting on unused, untapped uh, mountain of value. And that value is that they weren't recognizing what were the questions they wanted to ask of the data that they have. 
and they weren't straightforward business intelligence type of dashboard questions. Those are the finance rear view mirror questions that we've been asking for a long period of time. But really with the onset of the EMRs and the ability to capture nuanced information about not just patient care, but the metadata about the care your caregivers are providing to patients is an untapped and an unbelievably wealthy resource. And so I actually got back into the healthcare world by managing a business intelligence team for a, a hospital in the Midwest, which is where I live. And it gave me a better understanding of just how much it's needed and not necessarily the opportunity to apply the data to different areas and to different problems, but it's needed by the actual caregivers themselves. If there's anything that I hear on a regular basis, more often than not, it's from individual leaders and caregivers of, I know the information's there, but I'm not getting anything back. And to me, that's a value problem that we are asking our folks to input information constantly into EMR systems. It's just a one-way street. They're putting information in, but they're not getting any insight out. And that, I think, is one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the past five or 10 years or so in the healthcare industry is the recognition that we really have the opportunity to create a two-way street of value. We're asking people to put insight or put information in, but we're also able to provide insight back to them. And to me, that's just exciting. That's what brought me to the administrative side of healthcare within business intelligence and then eventually into Providence. And I think like a lot of other people managing the issue of our day, which is how do we get more done with the folks that we've got available? And it's not necessarily that the workload is getting greater and greater and greater. Our workforce is shrinking, but our processes that we apply that workforce to are not adjusting. We're still trying to get the same amount of activity out of fewer people without making changes to our processes. And that's just not sustainable. And that's something that I work on in Providence in particular. It's a multifaceted answer to that question, like, what do we do there? It's not one thing. There is no silver bullet. But I'm proud to say I'm part of a team that really does engage with that in a meaningful way. And I'm excited to kind of dig into a little bit more with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for setting the stage there, Marta. It's fantastic. And I really appreciate it. And yes, it makes complete sense why you are such an ardent believer and champion of listening. So I appreciate the historical view on that as well. Let's kind of dive right into it and kind of start at a higher level and get into the weeds a bit. Was I was getting ready for this conversation with you, Marty. I loved how you frame up what is workforce optimization? What does that mean to Providence? And some of the information that digested prior to this conversation is that you mentioned that workforce optimization is part of Providence HR and support the workforce strategy and analytics division that you partner with operational and administrative leaders across the system to support strategic caregiver and technology objectives. Of course, yes, that is an intentionally high, high level statement, but let's go into that. Let's pick it apart a bit. What does that mean today? What does that mean in regards to where we are as an industry, not just within Providence, but of course, as you know, we talked about earlier, what does this look like for all of us writ large with amazing community rally around this podcast? They're challenged with the same exact issues that you are working on diligently. Let's start at a high level on what exactly that just meant of what we discussed, what is workforce optimization? And what does that mean for where we currently are in the state of things with healthcare as we see it today? Sure. And you hit it on the head. It's multifaceted. It's a yes and approach to things. I do exist within the HR space. I manage a group that is non-traditional in the HR space. We're not doing benefits. We're not working on our pay sheets and whatnot. We're actually looking at workload, which a lot of folks on listening to this podcast might think, well, that's a bit more of an operations perspective. And I would agree with you, but I would add another, it's a yes and. What we recognize and where the roots of our group in workforce optimization came from is that if you're able to work on solving some of the workload issues, it is truly a workforce impact. And I think in the years past, we've probably beat the heck out of the Six Sigma world and trying to increase process improvement or efficiency, which is great. But at the end, you know, when you look at the results of that, who are the folks that bear the brunt of the change that comes from an activity like that? It's your individual workforce. The folks that are having eye contact with the patients, they're the ones that have to change their processes. They're the ones that have to actually make that implementation. And there's nothing wrong with trying to look for a better mousetrap from a process perspective, but it essentially just leaves a shifting of responsibilities. We're asking people to do things in a different order. We're asking them to potentially do things they maybe didn't do before. So there's an overall change. What my group is looking at is whether or not there's an opportunity to apply a technology to the pain points that our caregivers are seeing. So we put the caregiver at the center of all of our research and all of our questions. And we might at times come to some of the same pain points and solutions that you would see folks in rev cycle or in operations traditionally looking at, but we're trying to recognize what's the value to the caregiver. 
And what we see shifting right now is the opportunity to not just impact the process or the flow of activity, but to actually disrupt it by removing activity from the flow and therefore giving back the one thing that you can't create, which is time. And so our opportunity at the end of the day is to apply technology to those pain points that our caregivers say are an issue and to potentially remove them or reduce the actual workload. And I think that that's something that's slightly different from an HR perspective that has been done in the past. We've beat the heck out of uh, process improvement. What we haven't done is beat the hell out of the workload quotient there, or the workload element, I should say. And so that's what we work on. So, of course, it begs the question, and you know, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of what AI and automation can mean for healthcare. So, of course, it springboards a comment back to you, Marty. What you kind of just flirted with is this notion of automating some of those processes and those systems to give that most critical asset that we all have time back to that caregiver, right? And I know that's part of your portfolio and what you and the team are working on. We'll discuss that in just a moment. But also, I also want to discuss the mindset in healthcare around automation, around AI, and a little bit of adversarial relationship currently, right? Because you know, as old as I do, healthcare doesn't change rapidly. We are behind in a lot of things. It's just the nature of how healthcare is. And that is including in our mindset, right? And is that something that you and the team are also contemplating, considering when you're looking at how to optimize what is the mindset of those caregivers? What is the mindset of my colleagues at Providence in regards to automating some of our way out of this? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's two things I want to hit on that. First of all, it's a change management issue. It's a communication issue because you're right. There's going to be the initial stigma in an industry and healthcare is no different that automation means you're going to take my job. And that's a uh, understandably because up until now, generations of the workforce have looked at automation as robotics something that is going to do a physical activity that you no longer need to be doing. I wish we had that luxury. And I know that probably isn't the best statement to make. I wish we had the luxury of saying that we could go ahead and cut workforce. At this point, the desire is not to necessarily cut workforce through automation, which is, again, a little bit of a different shift, is we're not trying to get our one FTE to work like 1.25. What we are trying to do is get our FTE, who is already working at a 1.25 or a 1.5, to actually have 1.0 worth of work. And so we're trying to right-size the work itself rather than enhance the workforce through our automations. And so that's a bit of a different shift. And there certainly is a communication process that goes along with that. And I think you said it right. In healthcare, there's a technology is a dirty word. It has in the past created a lot of upheaval, but I think part of that is the reason that healthcare is two businesses under one roof. You've got a, the administration and the management of healthcare systems and of uh, hospitals and clinics, et cetera. There's the business side of it. And then at the same time, there's the administration of healthcare itself. So there's the actual care you provide to people at a bedside. And many times those two businesses or those two processes are at odds with each other. And technology, as we've evolved over the years, we think is sort of the great equalizer. But you know, we brought EMRs in years ago. We mandated it that it needed to happen. It is a good idea that we have better data. It is a good idea that we have better insight and visibility to what we have going on. But at the end of the day, an EMR at the end is really a better finance tool than it is a clinical capture tool. And it was really built for that. And I think that moving into the next generation of EMRs or the tools that are going to be built on top of them that are going to augment what you don't get from those are going to try and, I believe, fill those gaps and make it more of a great equalizer where your EMRs are good for finance to capture how do I charge for something? How do I make sure that the business side of the house stays afloat? But then how do I get that value back from the clinical side as well? How do I help decision makers from a clinical perspective get the information they need to be able to continue to make decisions in a more fast and efficient way? So I think those things need to happen at the same time. They're currently moving in that direction, I believe. But that's definitely an uphill challenge. The perception of technology is definitely an issue. So No, absolutely. You're spot on. We've created this Frankenstein monster bit of ourselves. And now we need to, as leaders, unwind that a bit and figure out how do we create a path forward that's a, a little bit, it uh, doesn't have as many roadblocks and speed bumps along the way. I know we can do it. We have incredibly smart and passionate people in the industry. I know we can get there, but let's stick on the clinical side that you just mentioned. Yes, there are two big sides of the house in healthcare, the administrative and clinical side. Let's frame up the clinical side. And what I mean by that is let's talk about the work that you guys are doing in your office how many caregivers is that touching within Providence? Maybe at an even higher level for our audience. 
frame up the magnitude of Providence in regards to some of how many caregivers, how many patient visits, et cetera, what that reach looks like for your guys' health system. And then from there, would love to discuss, because this is the part that I always love to hear, that end user feedback. What are you hearing from your caregivers on the ground about some of the work that you guys are doing from your office and how it's impacted them? So first, let's frame up the size of Providence and what that means for our nation. And we'll talk about some of that feedback from those caregivers that are so important to the health and care of so many around our country. Yeah, absolutely. So Providence is a West Coast-based system of hospitals, and we stretch from the state of Alaska all the way down to the state of Washington, Oregon, California. And then we kind of, we take a quick little hook over. We've got a small presence in New Mexico and a presence in Texas. And we're 52 hospitals, a little over a thousand clinics, whether they are uh, primary care, urgent care, express care. And we operate our own health plan in the state of Oregon and in a couple other places. So we're a pretty large organization. At any one time, you're looking at anywhere between 115 and 130,000 employees that are Providence employees not to mention those that are in and out in a um, contracted basis. So yeah, we're a pretty big system. And the nice part about being in a big system is that you have a lot of opportunity to dig into problems. And if you like myself and you like puzzles, this is a really good one. Healthcare is the industry of choice if you like puzzles. And if you really want to dig into how you get down to solving some of those on a large scale, Providence and uh, systems like Providence are great places to be at. They're incubators. You know, I also love the opportunity to have resources from Providence. And by resources, I don't necessarily mean financial. What I'm talking about is that listening piece again. Resources, meaning other folks, other caregivers to be able to turn to. These are not one-off problems. These aren't puzzles that you solve on your own. Nobody could possibly understand the complexity of healthcare alone. It's something that you need to have a team and you need to have a culture that is working towards solving problems together. Because without the insight from other folks, without their experience, their subject matter expertise, you're only going to know fragments and bits and pieces of a bigger problem. You run into ripple effects all the time, and especially with technology. And in some of the work that we engage with, you know, one of the primary work streams we have is around automating tasks. And so right now we've been working with our primary care group and recognizing not how do we turn the apple cart over and completely automate entire processes, but where are there options or opportunities within a process to be able to say, I can take that work away from you. That's 15 or 20 minutes worth of phone calls that you don't have to make every single hour that I can automate or I can move the information faster to you. Can I augment your ability to work, whether or not it's a completely automated or not? And so those are things that we're being asked to do on a pretty regular basis. And that's part of our ongoing conversation. That doesn't happen without us understanding where do we make that impact. But back to the ripple comment of if you go in and take away one piece of a process, say I can automate a part of a medical assistant is doing with regard to a, a referral. Great, if I take that away, I need to be able to understand up the chain and down the chain, what's the impact there? Who's working with that MA? Where does that MA's workload go to? And so you really need to be able to look at things from a bigger picture. And you can't just say, well, that's an automatable activity, so get it out of there and, and let's add the technology. You have to be a bit more thoughtful than that. Because at the end of the day, all of that work ties back to a patient. All of that work ties back to not just that patient's satisfaction, but their actual care. And when you think about it and put it in that perspective, you have to take much more measured steps when you're going to make change. And that may oftentimes slow down the process or slow down the change process or the integration process, but that's meaningful change. You're not going into things just because you can. You're going into making change and making process updates because you know you should and you've looked at it from multiple perspectives. Is it good for the caregiver, which is my primary perspective? Yes. But that doesn't mean I also don't look at a potential change through the lens of the business, or I don't look at it from the lens of the patient as well. And if it doesn't fit that sort of little Venn diagram of the caregiver, the business, and the patient, well, then it doesn't fit. There needs to be some rework. We need to go back and find some other way to go about doing it. And so I think it definitely takes into account all of that activity. And to your original question, none of that happens without interaction with the operational folks. None of that happens in a vacuum. And so what we get back from our operational folks is what I've been explaining to you is be thoughtful about what we're going to do here. And when you think about putting the caregiver at the center of things, there's a lot of examples in healthcare where that didn't happen. And I talked about the EMR earlier, and I was at an offsite a couple of weeks ago, and one of the executives came in and was saying, you know, hey, I remember when we used to have to go pull a file off the shelf when we wanted to get somebody's information. And it sounds insane to us nowadays, like, yes, you've got a physical file and we probably all got in our head that stack of 
10 feet high and 25 foot long wall of files of how did you ever find anything in there? But then when you actually really break it down and start thinking about, well, what is the EMR right now? Instead of having a 10 foot high, 20 foot long wall, you have an infinitely tall height and an infinite long shelf in which you can store information. And so if you don't name it right, if you don't have the proper nomenclature, the proper structure, the proper places that you can put things, and you don't have explicit directions for how people could go get it, the number of pages that it might sit in, the number of clicks that they can go through, we actually took what was a complex system and multiplied that complexity many, many times over when we brought the EMRs in without actually thinking about the caregiver that's got to go get that information. So instead of swiveling their chair around and pulling a, a alphabetically based sort of Dewey Decimal System type of file out of a wall, they now have to sift through how many folders? I don't know, an infinite number of folders. Each one of our records on an individual patient can run up to 100 pages for just a normal patient. Now, in each one of those 100 pages is a discrete piece of information. And so now we're asking our healthcare adjacent roles like MAs and PCCs and folks like that to know where that stuff is at. So did we make their lives easier? I'm not sure. We certainly made it easier for us to code and bill and push information out because there's decision trees that know exactly where that information's at. But that's a lot to ask a human being to be able to understand. And that's where a lot of our work comes in. We're not going to change that system altogether. But how do we either take that activity off of their plate and automate it? Or is there an opportunity to augment the human being with technology to make it something that is manageable at the end of the day? So there's a lot of examples, I think, in healthcare and in technology in general where we didn't think before we jumped. And that's what we hear a lot from our caregivers and from our leaders is make sure you know what the implications are going to be. What a salient example. I certainly remember growing up, dating myself a bit here, but family member that worked in a clinic. And I remember seeing those actual manila folder files on the wall that you just described. But what a salient example. Like we all thought when we uh, all adopted EHRs, that, oh, this is going to be the next biggest thing. It's going to solve everything. And here we are. We may have made it even more complex. So thank you for sharing that very important example. So Marty, let's then discuss what's the end user feedback as we like to talk about in the startup world. What's the feedback you're receiving from your teammates within Providence? on some of the work that your office is helping lead? Are they a sigh of relief? Are they like, oh my gosh, where have you been all my life? Like, what's the feedback been? You know, I think it's a little bit of both really happy that we're there. And then there's also a bit of trepidation from some folks as well. You know, on the happy side, I would say, because we put the caregiver at the center of anything that we're looking at, that's a perspective that hasn't been taken and hasn't been publicized. It's not communicated all that much. And so we get a lot of, I'm really glad you're here and I'm really glad you're asking for my opinion. I'm glad you're talking to me here in the clinic or in the hospital to understand what my pain points are before you say, here's the next tool I want to bring in. Let me go find the pain point that this fits to. And so we're really trying to make sure we put the horse before the cart. And we recognize that the technology that we bring in is the tool in service to closing the gap that the pain point actually is surfacing. And so we get a lot of pats on the back for that. Thank yous for being there. A lot of people are very happy that we are engaged in that work. On the other side of that scale, there's a lot of folks that I think have been burned in just the example we were talking about before. Trust is not something that is just, you don't come to the table with a, an idea and somebody trusts you. You don't have a solution to a problem that somebody yeah, they, they're necessarily sure they've got a problem with it. You've got to really collaborate and work with them. And so I think that there are some folks that have trust issues with technology jumping in because they've been burnt by it. And especially within the past several years with COVID being what it is, the clinical side of our business has in many ways been through the ringer. And not in many ways, it has been through the ringer. But at the same time, as an industry, we still need to grow. We don't have the opportunity to shut the factory down on Friday afternoon and retool everything over the weekend, turn on the lights on Monday morning, and hey, we've got all the updates going. We live and work in a world where change needs to take place simultaneously. You've got to have a foot in the old world, the foot in the old processes, and a foot in the new processes. And when you're working with folks in a clinical perspective, that's not what they've been trained to do for the most part. Some of the leadership certainly has, but when you're working with those clinical folks and trying to mine them for the information, what's the next thing that would be useful to you as well as scale out to the organization, that's difficult. You don't have the same vocabulary. And so because you don't have the same vocabulary, there is oftentimes a level of distrust that goes into that. And so that's a bridge that we're definitely making inroads into overcoming. And part of that is making sure that our team is staffed with folks that have been in those dual roles. It's not a coincidence that I've got a clinical background. It's not a coincidence that there are a lot of other folks on my team 
that have clinical backgrounds. It's not everybody, but it is also a recognition that you do need to have some folks that can bridge that gap and translate those issues into how do you go about making a technological change or a process change to a felt pain point. And that's the difference. You've got what people are feeling and then what they're thinking about doing. And then also, you know, we start thinking about a little future state as well, Marty. Obviously, the notion of workforce optimization, the notion of helping solve this crisis in healthcare that's touching all of us, no matter where you reside in the healthcare industry, it is not going away. It's not going away anytime soon. And so give us one or two tips that you're seeing from your vantage point as an expert in this space, one or two insights of where things are heading in the next couple of years, not just for the industry at large, but also what you guys are focused on and, and excited about at Providence to help answer the call around this crisis that we're experiencing. Maybe one or two and love to unpack a couple of those. Sure. And I'll start with what people think of as the sexy answer and, and the, the answer du jour right now, which is the AI, the chat GPTs of the world. That's great. And I think in years, it'll be measured in years before as an industry, we're up to date on that. But as you mentioned earlier, we're oftentimes behind the curve in healthcare, especially when it comes to technology. And that's absolutely the case. You'd be amazed at how many places a simple bot that you could have a developer create in less than a day has an opportunity to make a meaningful change to the workplace and the environment in which our caregivers are applying their craft and that our patients are being seen. I still walk into clinics today and I'm handed a clipboard and a piece of paper. Our industry still has faxes. We are definitely behind the times, but what we're not recognizing is that each one of those is a medium. It's a mode of transmitting information, whether it's by pen or by fax or sending an email, et cetera. We've got many, many different modes of moving information, but we depend on only one source of information when it comes to healthcare in our EMRs. And so where I see things going in the next couple of years is the increase in interoperability. We're not going to necessarily get rid of all of those modes, but I think what we can do is apply technology, and it doesn't have to be the sexiest technology in the world, to be able to recognize information and determine where it needs to sit within the record of note. And so for us, we're an epic organization. So when we get a fax in, great. Can we start applying some OCR and deconstructing that fax and then reconstructing it into the epic account so that it goes into the discrete elements that it needs to be in? and doesn't cause rework down the line or doesn't cause errors down the line. Those aren't the biggest things in the world. That's not the chat GPTs. I do think that in several years, the work that we're doing now in healthcare will lead to some of that. I don't think that we've even come close to scratching the surface. We're still applying new technologies to old processes. And I think that our true accelerator will be when we break that mold of saying, why does it have to be this way? And start thinking about the end result that we're looking for and throw out the idea of the way that we have gotten there in the past. It doesn't have to be that way. And I think that's where some of these groundbreaking technologies are really going to take off. Until that happens, there will be interesting applications to existing processes, but there's going to be many years to come in that. So where I see the industry going is making better headway in some of the simpler, more straightforward technology applications. Love it. All about it. Sign me up because I agree there's things right now that can be solved with very simple means right today. But as you mentioned, it's going to take a while as well. So we'll put the crystal ball back on the shelf for now, Marty. Let's get back to current state. Amazing community rallied around the podcast. Love to help out our guests on the show. What's one problem need or question that you and the Providence team have that our community can be helping you with? Yeah, that's a great question and one that I don't get asked very much. I think as a consumer of healthcare, as everybody is, I think we need to have a better understanding that this is truly not a healthcare system or an individual hospital issue, that it's a national issue. It's an issue for all of us. And what I would like to see and the type of help that I would like to have is more collaboration across organizational lines. And you know, there, we certainly do compete against each other. Healthcare is an industry, so there's a competition associated with it. But it's one of the few, and I think maybe one of the only, that is we are all consumers of it. You can't get away from healthcare. And so when we talk about the communities that we serve, I'm talking about myself. And if I am part of that equation, part of the communities that, that Providence serves, then I want the best. I want to know that my organization is working with other people to solve the same problems that exist in my organization as they do in others. So what I would love to see is more collaboration in some of those inflection points. We go to conferences from time to time, and most of them are filled with, how do you sell people on different ideas? And that's great. They're trying to figure out, I've got a solution, doesn't match with the pain point that you've got, and that's fine. 
But I think we'd all be well served if we started to change that a little bit and started to talk more about the pain points that we have as a community and as a country when it comes to our healthcare before we think about what solutions we want to apply to them. Because those solutions are, although they're great in many ways, I think they think too small. And if I'm thinking about changing healthcare, it's not something that's going to happen because Providence started it only. It's going to be something that happened because the industry recognizes the way that we're working isn't tenable anymore. And I think when you put that into the workforce perspective, the lens of looking at it through the workforce perspective, there is no other untenable situation greater than what we've got right there at the moment. There's not enough people to manage the number of people walking through the door. The common element there is people. We need to be able to recognize that we are here to help ourselves and we need to start thinking a little bit more holistically instead of in our small box. Absolutely love that. And I know that there are people on the other side of this microphone and these speakers tuning in that uh, would absolutely love the conversation with you, Marty. How do they get a hold of you? Social media handles, websites, contact points online. How do they track you down? I'm not the best social media person. You can track me down on LinkedIn. It's under Martin Ray. And then you feel free to send me an email if you'd like. I'd love to start up a chat. I'm reachable at Providence at martin.ray at providence.org. So feel free to reach out. I'd love to actually make happen what I was just commenting on, of starting a conversation across organizational lines, across lines, wherever it might be, about the individual pain points. That's something we can all come together on. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. We're all in this together. That is for certain. So with that, for our listening community, feel free to head on into the episode notes to find all those contact points from Marty and his team. Or you can head over to our free global online community at passionatepioneers.com. There will be a post for Marty's episode where you can also leave some feedback, comments, or otherwise, and find those contact points online. Again, over at passionatepioneers.com. Marty, we're going to wind this one down. This was a phenomenal conversation. But before we get out of here, I have one more piece for you. It's a fill in the blank. I'm a passionate pioneer because? Because I am part of the community. And I think that gets me up and out of bed every day. There's not a lot of industries and there's not a lot of places that you can work on some of the biggest problems in the world and know that you've got some of the biggest impacts. And so to me, that gets me up and going every day. I'm passionate about healthcare because I'm a consumer of it. I'm passionate about healthcare because I love my communities. And I know that my organization wants to serve their communities and serve themselves in the best way possible. And that, that really does matter to me. What a phenomenal way to bring this episode to a close. Marty, we can hear the passion, we can sense it. You're doing incredible work. I was really looking forward to having this conversation today. I'm glad we were finally able to meet up and do exactly that. For now, Marty, thank you so much for taking time to be on the podcast, spending a few moments with our community and sharing all of the wonderful things that you're helping leave at Providence. But again, Marty, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Mike. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode.